it looks like we are live. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, gents. I want today to talk about Console Wars, which is my August book club selection. I read this book every summer, as I mentioned, and I'm really excited. I'm going to kick it off with an interview with essentially the star of the book, Tom Kalinske, former CEO of Sega of America, former CEO of Mattel, of Matchbox, and several other uh, companies in the toy space, and we'll talk about that in the interview. So um, I'll switch that over, and I'll turn off my fan as we go into this, and then I'll come back to wrap it all up uh, at the end. There you are. Good hey. morning. Good morning. I wanted to... Uh, and I grabbed these at the last minute to make sure I showed that I've got uh, oh wonderful consoles as old as myself. Well, I'm up the, I'm a in the home office above my garage. Otherwise, I'd go down in the basement and show you 800 Genesis games, two machines still hooked up, and an old uh, display we used to use in stores where you can switch from one game to another. Although it only held six different games, but anyway, from one to another. Oh, I still have a lot of stuff in the home somewhere. Wow. Do you know there's a whole subgenre on YouTube of uh, the videos of those in-store demos? Is of, that right? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, the machines. I was just watching one as I was as I was finishing up the book again. Is uh, It's like videos of guys. It was essentially training manuals for people in the stores to use those big machines. And so it shows the guy yeah. going through. And here's how you turn up the volume, change the games and everything. And it's like there's millions of views on them. Darn. Well, the one that I have downstairs uh, has five slots for cartridges and then one resident on the machine. So six games in total. And, uh, you know, you could switch from one to another. I don't remember. I know Sonic's on there. I know Streets of Rage is on there. Uh, I think Monaco Racing's on there. I'm not sure what else is on there. I'll have to go down and take a look. I forgot. Wow, that's... Uh... That's really that's that's a dream come true for me. I was always blowing on the cartridges, switching them around. <laughs> I, I also have a uh, Virtual Fighter arcade machine down there. Uh, I bet you've got a whole funhouse. Yeah, and then I have a pinball machine that Sega made years ago. Uh, and the theme of this particular pinball machine is Baywatch. And so it has all the gals in their red uh, bathing suits, and my daughters absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also have a... Well, yeah, they, they, they grew up around more of this uh, than any of us, really. Yeah, they did. Well, thank you for coming on. I was uh, really excited that uh, you responded to my, my outreach because this is uh, the third time. I basically read this book every summer. I read it the first summer it came out, and I was so enthralled with it that every summer it feels like a really nice, like almost beach read. And uh, I started about a year ago on my channel to talk about books that I really enjoy, especially around business, because it's not this isn't particularly a business book, but I think there's so much you can learn from the strategic moves that you made and, uh, through that era, and it's just a really great story overall. Especially because selfishly, I mean, I grew up playing Sega games. I was just a little, just slightly younger than I think the target demographic for Sega was, but Sonic 1 and 2, I mean, I can, I could probably draw you diagrams of the levels I played them so much, and uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an honor to speak to you. Oh, well, thank you. And you know, actually, even though Blake did not write it as a business book, it is being used, to my amazement, in some uh, business schools. Uh, I got a call, oh, I've had several different calls from professors that have, have said they're using it in their MBA marketing classes. One was Indiana University, and another one was uh, Vanderbilt University. And so I have spoken like we are now on Skype to those classes, uh, and I believe USC is using it as well. And some others were using it. I don't know if they still are or not. Anyway. I would, too. I think it's a, it is a great account, especially for a company that's trying to take over the, the gorilla in the industry, the way that you guys took on Nintendo, it's a, a fascinating look. And I, I like, I appreciate the the learnings from the moves you made, but also just the way that you work internally, and it and you can see the way that you constructed a team around this goal, and you energized people, and you got them really focused on things. It's what uh, Simon Sinek talks about now, which is that why your why was to really grow Sega and to really uh, make an impact on the gaming industry. That's for sure. Yeah. So. Um, for anybody that is not familiar with the book, or you know, I, I recommend that you get into it. But uh, Tom Kalinske was at Mattel, so he was uh, 
kind of the godfather of Barbie and Hot Wheels for a long time. Then you went on to be the CEO of Matchbox and then Sega of America, the father of Sonic. There's a great story in the book about how you kind of shaped Sonic around uh, bring, making him more Americanized versus the original uh, version of him. And then um, it talks about in the book a little bit. You were part of the group that started the ESRB, but I don't, I don't know you were officially in um, you know that founding group, but then also E3, the conference that's like it's huge now. You you were part of that because you were uh, kind of uh, put on the side by CES, right? CES didn't really respect yeah. video games at the yeah. time. Toy Industry Hall of Fame, which is huge, and then it looks like you're also an Eagle Scout. I wasn't an Eagle. I was a Star Scout. I was honored by the Boy Scout uh, Boy Scouts of America as a Man of the Year for uh, the New York group what, a few years ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then LeapFrog CEO for a while, and now uh, a few other things, but then Gazillion Entertainment is what you're focused on today? No, that we, we ended up uh, selling that. I'm now focused mostly on ed tech companies, and also I'm trying to get a kid's television show on air called Dear Doodles, which teaches kindness, empathy, and inclusion. It really would be targeted at, at quite young children, so working on that, and then working on a couple of ed tech companies. Well, that looks like a thread that really goes through your entire career, though. So it's uh, to really help kids and, and inspire and teach. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and video games, by the way, really inspired me in that area because I did. When you look at video games and how uh, evolving they are, and how men and women get so uh, not addicted but so uh, engaged with them, my question the education world was why can't we make curriculum as interesting and involving as video games are so that's kind of a passion that i've been working on and also you know in video games we can adjust the level to the ability of the player why can't we do the same thing with curriculum and education so those kinds of things i'm still working on oh yeah and if i if i would have remembered i would have grabbed the leapfrog toys that my uh, my sons play with now <laughs> we still got tons of those around so uh, specifically to console wars, I had a few questions for you, and then when we'll talk about uh, some of the more recent things. Is uh, you know the book is so detailed and and it had so many accounts from different people. Like how much time did, had you spent with Blake as part of the process to to get that together? Oh my gosh, many many I get many many hours, and, and it's kind of a funny story. When he first approached me years ago, it was actually at a New York Toy Fair. And he said, "Hey, I want to do a book on the on the video game industry when you were involved in it from 1990 to 96." Uh, and I said, "That's really interesting, Blake. There are probably 200 people in the world that care." And he said, "No, no, no, you're wrong. Thousands of people are involved and interested in that period of time." So anyway, from that point on, we spent hours and hours and hours together. He came out here to California and practically lived with us for a while and. And obviously, uh, besides interviewing me and my entire family for hours and hours and hours, he interviewed everybody I knew, you know, in the, in the industry and some people I didn't know. So I actually, after when I read the book, I learned a lot about Nintendo that I didn't know because obviously I wasn't on the best of terms with some of those guys. So anyway, hours and hours and hours. So what was uh, how much detail was new to you in that process, even from inside of Sega? Well, inside of Sega... Uh, one thing that I re learned that I never understood while I was at Sega, you know, I initially had such a great relationship with the Sega of Japan and with Nakayama, the, the CEO uh, and chairman, uh, you know, and, and that started to deteriorate, and I never understood why, because we were so successful in the U.S. and also in Europe, we were, the company was so successful, and I couldn't understand why did this relationship deteriorate where all of a sudden, I felt like the folks in Japan were fighting against what I wanted to do here in the United States. And the book revealed that there was a lot of jealousy uh, involved, and, uh, and and with good reason to some degree, because Nakayama-san would go into the Monday morning decision meeting room with his Japanese staff and beat the hell out of them because they weren't as successful as we were in the U.S. And, it, and in fact, as Blake pointed out, they never got above a 10% share of the game market in Japan, whereas we got over a 5% share here in, here in the United States. And so you can imagine if you're over there and you're constantly being berated and beaten up and yelled at because you're not as successful as the, as the team in the U.S. or Europe was, you're going to start to hate those guys. And that's exactly what happened. 
Yeah, yeah, and you get a sense of that too. There was there any like juicy things that you really enjoyed learning about Nintendo? Well, there were there's actually there were, there are things that uh, I had been told that they had like a dartboard of me of, with my face on it in uh, in, uh, in uh, Seattle, and I you know I didn't really quite realize how deep the uh, the empathy went <laughs> against me over there because you know frankly when I. I had conversations when we were, you, you mentioned the ESRB, and, and actually that flowed out of, we did our own video game rating system at Sega because we were going after an older audience, and, and I felt we needed it, and initially I wanted to adopt the, the movie system that, that Jack Valenti had uh, initiated for the movie industry years and years ago, the PGGR kind of rating, but he wouldn't us use that so we had to develop our own and we hired dr arthur pober to run that effort and he hired a geologist and child development experts and psychologists and educators and put the rating system for sega together and when we started to uh, adopt that for the entire industry nintendo was the last holdout i mean they didn't want to do it they didn't think they needed it and so i did have conversations with howard lincoln about that uh and eventually came around and came on came on board but uh, that rated, and they, of course they refused to say it was the Sega rating system, so it became the, the industry rating system and was changed slightly. Dr. Prover was smart enough to adopt it a little bit in different areas and tweak it and change some of the initials that were used on it. Uh, but it essentially was the Sega rating system. It was just, uh, you know, now it changed to for the entire industry. They had to wash your smell off of it. That was the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, anybody that grew up in my age and, and like, you know, some of my, my younger siblings, like, that M rating meant, like, you really had to beg and, like, <laughs> and do all of your chores to make sure you get that video game because those were those were the ones that were very rare to be able to get. Uh, and I remember getting my first, that's like your first R-rated movie. It's like your first M-rated yes. video game. That was always what you were shooting for. Have uh, Have you listened to the audio book? Um, you know, I haven't listened to the entire audiobook. I listened to parts of it, and I did it long ago. I haven't done it recently. I should do that again if it's still, I should. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Well, I was wondering how accurate some of the uh, accents were because, like, some of the accents when when it's conversations between you and, and Toyota and, and everybody else, it's you know the, the the narrator is very funny as he goes into those different characters. Yes, he is. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Shinobu uh, Toyota is a, was a, my right arm and, a, and, a, and still is a great friend uh, and extremely helpful to me. And he did have a slight Japanese accent, even though he's lived in this country for a very, very long, long period of time. So I, the accent was probably accurate for, for him, somewhat accurate for him. Um, and then I think there were cases where they did uh, some of the uh, uh, British accents, too, as I recall, with Nick Alexander or whatever. Now, those were pretty accurate. Uh, I don't know if they did my accent correctly or not. I'm kind of like a Midwestern guy. Yeah, you were just you were just like the you you were really it was almost like a first person book in so many ways because you could really tell. I mean, at least it seemingly is that he Blake spent the most time with you out of anybody else because it was really from the Sega and the Tom Kalinske point of view. Yes, that's true. And and he spent a lot of time with Al Nielsen and a lot of time with, with uh, Shinobu Toyota and Paul Rio. And Madeline uh, Canapa Schroeder and uh, Evie Beebe. Uh, Evie yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's a terrific person. Oh yeah. So then, so you went from the toy industry into the video game industry, and, and it talks about how you know your storytelling was really part of that. Was that an uncomfortable move for you as you made that, like professionally, because you had been in there so long? What were some of the things that uh, you really took with you into that new world of video games? That's a great question. And actually, I don't know if are aware or many people are aware is you know when i was at mattel one of the reasons that mattel just about went into bankruptcy in the early 80s was because of the failure of intellivision now the, the story of intellivision is it started as a, a small uh, group of guys who were doing electronic handheld games under Matt, mike katz and a, and a creative guy named uh, chang and uh it was spun out of the out of the toy company its own entity, and I was kind of annoyed about that because I ran, or was at the time I guess just head of marketing and product development at the toy company, but essentially they took that away from me. So I didn't have a great warm feeling about the video game industry, particularly when in television collapsed uh, following the Atari collapse, and now all of a sudden it was it was dragging the entire company close to bankruptcy, even though 
WRB was doing great and Hot Wheels were doing great and He-Man and Masters of the Universe was doing great. But nevertheless, because there was so much loss created by the Intellivision fail, fall, fall off, that the banks wouldn't give us working capital any longer. So I did not have a great warm spot in my heart for the video game industry at that time. And in fact, I had to go to uh, Drexel Burnham with the chairman of the company and basically beg uh, Mike Milken to refinance the company. Otherwise, we were going to have to go Chapter 11. Fortunately, Mike did refinance Mattel, and the rest is history. We came out of the the doldrums of that. We sold off everything except for the toy business, and the company became very successful again. So following that, here I am. I, I go over, and, and with a great friend of mine, David Ye, we end up getting Matchbox and taking it out of uh, bankruptcy in the U.K. and turning it around and building it in, the U, in, in Europe, in the U.K., and the United States. And at that time started paying a little bit of attention to the video game industry again and actually met Howard Lincoln and we were going to do a matchbox and did do a matchbox uh, video game. So I got reacquainted with Howard and also Nakayama san wanted us at Matchbox to become the distributor for the 8-bit master system in the United States and and, and Europe. And uh, I looked at it and I said, "Gee, this is too similar to what failed in the past. I don't I don't think we sh- we should and so we didn't do it. But anyway, I had met or got reacquainted with Nakayama san at that time, and that sort of led to the path of him coming after me and, and hiring me, uh, convincing me that 16 bit was really the wave of the future, and that color handheld was the wave of the future, and, and convinced me to, to take on the, the role as, as CEO of Sega of America. The whole, but the whole transition from the toy industry to the video game industry. Initially, I, I didn't have a great feeling for the video game industry, but then later, as I saw what I thought 16-bit could become, you mentioned storytelling, and I always loved storytelling. I mean, we did great stories on He-Man and Masters of the Universe, and I thought, boy, this is the same kind of thing. If you write a great story, if you start with a great story for a video game. You can turn it into a, a wonderful property, and of course, that's what happened. Yeah, and yet that's why you had to get rid of Sonic's girlfriend. I mean, she was she was terrible. But didn't fit the, she didn't fit the story. <laughs> well, so I actually didn't know that that much detail because it seems like in the book that Toyota comes out of nowhere. He knows your name from the toy industry, but I, I yeah. had no idea that you had actually had some conversation with uh, him. So that actually that connects a really cool dot. Yeah. So then, uh, the the other thing, the last point in the book I want to catch on is um, you, the story about you getting into Walmart and working with a Walmart buyer was one of my favorite parts of it. Being in the sales world now, um, you know Angela Duckworth now is famous for her grit term. Like, what do you think, either in your childhood or something early on, gave you the grit to like pursue the Walmart channel so heavily and have so much like conviction that you were going to get in there? Well, you, again, going back to my Mattel days, you have to understand that Walmart was an extremely important customer for Mattel. And I knew all of those guys, all of the senior management very, very well. I knew Sam Walton very, very well. Sam used to, I met him early, early in my in my career as a marketing guy, sitting on the wooden benches that they used to have in the headquarter office in Bentonville, Arkansas, where Sam would come out Thursdays when all the vendors came in and we all sat in these rows of literally church pews, wood pews that were set up in the office. And Sam would come out and say, with his southern accent, wonderful accent, hi y'all, my name's Sam Wald, let's get to know one another. He'd come out and talk to all of us that are about to sell his guy something, right? And so I knew Sam from the, from those early days and, and he liked me for some reason and, and he, was, he was a pilot, you know, and he used to fly his plane and look at the count the number of cars that were in a Walmart parking lot versus how many were in a Kmart or a Target nearby. So I got to do all this stuff with Sam. And I knew all of the senior management there. So you could imagine, and they were so important to us at Mattel, you could imagine how frustrating it was for me to be in this role at Sega and not be able to get my friends in senior management at Walmart to buy Sega to buy Genesis and software because they were afraid of being punished by Nintendo. So it was extremely frustrating for me, and I was determined to 
overcome that. And that's why we did all those crazy things we did in Bentonville in order to get the Genesis on Walmart shelves. Yeah, yeah. If that doesn't tease up the book, uh, that I think that chapter itself is is worth reading uh, for it there. So now, th- is the the Rolodex that was described in the book is that going to go into a national archive somewhere? Because uh, that too sounds like it it was worth its weight in gold. And it's probably it was your old school one, right? It was the rot- rotating one. I actually have it on the floor of this office. Yeah, you got to save <laughs> you want that. Me to get it? You, you want to see it? Gra- yeah, grab it. Hang on one second. trays to bring but it's literally four trays that look like this connected together off the side so it is a lot of index cards and a lot of names of, of people from the 80s and, and 90s that were very important to me <laughs> that's the original linkedin right there yes it is that's how we used to make sure we had contacts with everybody oh yeah no that's great uh, so thank you for talking about the book a little bit. I just have a, a couple of questions. Uh, have you played or do your children play Fortnite? What do you think about Fortnite? I've, I've tried Fortnite, and I know one of my sons is playing it. Uh, he's more and it wasn't uh, aggressive enough for him, I, I guess. He's more of a uh, guy. Uh, but I've tried it. I have it on the phone. I think it's, it's fun because it's easy to get into, and it's easy to start playing. And it is it's, it's quite a bit... Quite addictive, so I enjoy it. I think that's a it's a good one. How much would your mind have been blown if you described Fortnite to 1992 Tom Kalinske playing the Sega? Never would have believed it's possible. <laughs> Although when you were you were innovating on the Sega TV concept, which is something that we're only really getting to now, which is fascinating, like the yeah. live stream on demand gaming. I think yeah. that was that was very ahead of its time. It, it was, and it was a, it was a great effort, and uh, I'm proud we did it. Uh, we did, after all. Uh, now I, I may get these numbers wrong, but I think we had like 25,000 people at one point online uh, playing, and of course we wrote we could rotate the games out of this system to a degree every month. So I mean, I think the total capacity might have been 25 or 30 games a month, but and we take some out and add some in, and still keep the number at 25 or 30. That's all we could handle. But that was a heck of a project, I'll tell you. I mean, I, I remember my good friend Joe Miller getting really mad at me over that because I went down to R&D one day and he had all these cable boxes set up in the room. And I didn't know that every cable system has a different technology for its, or at least in those days, for the cable box that they use. So literally every city could be a little bit different from the next city. And it was a heck of an effort to make them work. With the uh, with with Genesis, oh, I know, and because uh, I I tried some of the earlier stuff too in, in video games, and uh, still barely there. But you know, we're getting there with the internet, just way ahead of your time. And then, so the the Game Gear is about as big as a Nintendo Switch. Have you played some of the newer consoles? Yeah, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, it, this is kind of funny. St- it's not so funny for me. I had a stroke uh, eight months ago. That affected the the left side, my left hand, and my left eye, and my left leg. And when I was in therapy, recovering from the stroke in physical therapy, they had me playing a switch for crying out loud. <laughs> and so I, I had an opportunity. Trust me, I have not played a lot of Nintendo in my life, but they made me. And it was uh, it was kind of fun. They should know who you are. They should Google it. Well, they they took a picture of it. It's somewhere online. Al Nielsen, of course, got hold of the picture of me playing a Nintendo and, and thought this was, you know, treachery. He did how he couldn't believe I was actually doing it. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're in good health and uh, you're still pushing forward to some of the games. So, as far as like Leapfrog and, and education, what what are you really excited about now as you continue to pursue bringing more of that to to the children? Yeah. Well, as I when we started this conversation, first of all the ability of video game technology to involve and engage what I think is just fantastic and I'm trying to do that with curriculum and then also I mentioned it's easy in the video game world for us to adopt excuse me adapt the level of play to the ability to the skill level of the player we should be able to do the same thing in 
in, uh, in with educational curriculum that's presented online or on a computer or in a software app. And, and so working on that. And then the third part of it is to personalize it to the child. So let's say you are really into cars. You hate math. Why can't we bring mathematics to you in a car paradigm? Use cars and everything about cars to teach mathematic principles or science principles, for that matter. And so, those are the kinds of things I'm working on, uh, and I'm, I'm doing it with uh, trying to do. Trying to, we're trying a game to make particle physics fun and interesting out of a company named Lightyear out of the Finland, and a couple of the guys who were early on and founders of Rovio uh, have come over and founded this company. And you can imagine Rovio uh, or Birds is sort of a physics uh, game, yeah. uh, taking that, that paradigm further and, and teaching more uh, physics, teaching about the elements and that sort of thing and what happens when you combine elements, but do it in a fun and interesting way is something that's going on over there uh, that I'm involved with. And then, and then here, um, uh, trying to, as I, as I mentioned to you, I'm trying to create a new brand, a new television show called Doodles. That we teach kindness, empathy, and inclusion, and, and we created 12 characters. Some of those characters are real outgoing. Some of them are really shy, Don't and introverted. Uh, so how do we get the introverted child character to engage with the extrovert? And getting kids to understand that there are differences in their personalities, and, and it's important to engage with each other uh, Learn things from each other. So those are some of the things that I'm working on, and and then I'm doing some stuff in higher ed as well. That show is it something you could go direct on like on YouTube or, or some way to get there? Or you're going through traditional television. No, no, you're exactly right. I, we probably we haven't decided yet. But we probably are going to have to start on YouTube. Uh, it's the kind of show that, that might it lend itself not so much to traditional TV more to a Netflix or uh, uh, another kind of, of, of channel that's interested in in, uh, in streaming shows of this sort over the Internet. So that's probably the route we're going to take. The other one, I've followed a company called Super Dope TV that is, they're trying to be like a Netflix, but they're looking for original IP on that sort of stuff. But what a great time for that too. I mean, it seems like the convergence of, you know, massive online courses, higher education, and all that stuff seems to be coming together now the same way that the video game industry exploded in the early 90s. You seem to be in the right place at the right time. Well, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> trying to stay busy. Trying to stay active. Uh, and, and you're right. You know, massive online courses, people are kind of poo-pooing them now. Maybe they're saying, oh, gee, yeah, 200,000 people signed up for a computer science course, but only 5% uh, finished it. Well, yeah, but 5% of 200,000 is still huge number and it's a lot larger than most of the people taking uh, computer science as an introductory course at all of our universities combined so on, online uh, learning is 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 coming along and it's really important to do it well great well thank you for your time tom really uh really glad you came on and uh, i'll link to the projects you're working on now and i encourage anybody to check out the console wars book well thank you great talking with you great to meet you tom All right, so that was Tom Kalinske. What a cool guy. There's a couple of really good videos if you search his name on YouTube where he actually spoke at Stanford and talked a little bit about the book. And so there's some, some really good stuff, and I'm really appreciative that he was able to come on and just kind of chat with me for a little bit. So uh, Console Wars, I think it, you can easily tell through what I've said about the book uh, prior to this and in the interview, I'm a huge fan. Uh, it is by Blake J. Harris. I th it, it's his first book. The Amazon kind of teases it. You know, um, Moneyball and Accidental Billionaires kind of set the stage for this type of book. The audiobook is nearly 21 hours and it is not very filled with like fluff. There's a lot of uh, business books that I read where there's like two chapters that's like, why is this chapter even in here? It's it's pretty dense and it's a narrative nonfiction, which is what I really gravitate to. So they're telling a story across all of this time and they're bringing in different um, different parts of the time in history. And some of the, there's like quick histories that you get as you're listening through the book. So you get quick histories on 
Betamax versus VHS, uh, Super Mario, there's a great chapter on just how Super Mario came to be and the character itself. You get a quick, uh, you get a quick story about the Super Mario um, video or um, the Super Mario movie that came out and the disaster that that was. Um, Nike working with agencies, Nintendo's history, Sega's history, obviously. The inception of PlayStation, so that one of the main characters is Olaf Olafsson throughout the book, and he is the guy that really spearheaded the PlayStation uh, move or the PlayStation itself when it started, uh, Acclaim and Mortal Kombat, the Pepsi Challenge with New Coke, and then Rare as a game studio, which for me is a very important studio because it produced some of my favorite Nintendo games, specifically GoldenEye, and uh, I'll be talking about that. So some really great stuff packed into the book. I do highly recommend uh, either listening to it on Audible or checking out the book. Um, and it also talks about some of the things that Sega pioneered, which you know the reason that f- this has changed now, but for the longest time, you would buy video games and movies on a Tuesday. Well, Sega invented that as a delivery date for video games with Sonic Tuesday in the '90s, and then all media has then started started to become this event, this launch event on Tuesdays. And now I believe it's moved to Fridays. So, you know, things hit Friday on uh, iTunes now, but that was a uh, something that. Sonic cooked up to try and beat out Nintendo. Uh, they also pioneered the game rating system. So very early on, it was like adult only uh, and things, but then it evolved into the ESRB, which we talked about in the interview. So when teen, everyone, mature, that sort of thing. And then they also talked, talk, you know, spawning off of the releases, they talked about having Christmas every month. So they wanted something for the retailers to look forward to every single month, like Mortal Kombat launching or Street Fighter launching. You know, they wanted new tentpole games to really rise out of there and that came out of that 90s era Um, and so you know talking about the book a little bit critically I didn't get to ask Tom about the main criticism I see of the book is that there's injected dialogue to help move the story along but the dialogue is deemed as kind of cheesy I think you know I take it for what it's worth it's supposed to move the book along I really didn't mind it I wanted to see I I would like to get his thoughts on there but I thought it was great and my favorite part of the book is that you get this look into the office politics and the machinations behind all the decisions that are made it's easy sometimes to forget that these are companies made up of people but a book like this dives in and shows you that it's all these people making decisions and I think that's what I find so useful in the book is that you know, all the decisions they were making to fight Nintendo and try and build a name for themselves in the industry is just really fascinating to understand. And and the other thing, too, and this is why I was really uh, happy to get Tom Kalinske on, is that he, not single-handedly, but he was very responsible for essentially quadrupling the sales of Sega in the early 90s, and he changed the course of Sega's history. And he talks about how there was this push-pull between Sega of Japan, Sega of America, and you, and you see a lot of that in the book. Uh, but you get to see his thought process, You know the fact that he was modifying the Sonic character that was developed by Sega of Japan in order to be more Americanized and then ultimately very successful uh, is really fascinating. The thing I will say is that this book spoils you on video game books. I've read, after l- listening to this, I went and looked for similar stories about Nintendo or about Sony and the PlayStation. I'm trying to find more books like this, and I've I've listened to several of them. If there's one that you like, I would love to let me know. But, you know, I bought a um, a Super Mario book that was just kind of like, eh, eh. And that's, I think that's the reason that this book is now, it's been made into a documentary by Sony Pictures, and it's now optioned to be a feature film uh, written by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and the, the team, you know, like the super bad team, uh, those guys. And so I really hope that comes soon. I know that Tom has mentioned in interviews that, you know, it's coming the documentary is done, but uh, they're waiting on some some more Hollywood stuff. And so that's Console Wars. I think it's a worthwhile book, a great summer read, but also it's like a business marketing uh, nonfiction book and pretty good in my opinion. With that, I'm going to be doing my live stream for September's book at the end of September, not halfway through uh, October like this one. And I'm doing the Robin Williams biography by Dave Itzkoff, and I'm going to be hosting Paul McGregor on that episode to talk about you know men's men's mental health and and depression because ultimately uh, that's the through line of Robin Williams' career, and so I'll be doing that at the end of the month, and then in October I'm going to be doing. Um, 
Principles by Ray Dalio. I have a guest in mind for that one, not Ray Dalio. Uh, and then in November, I'm going to be hosting Parker York Smith on here for the CAA book Powerhouse, which is one of my favorite books and I'm looking forward to revisiting. So that is the book club for this month. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Tom Klinsky for coming on. And for you, thank you for watching, which enabled me to get Tom Klinsky on here for an interview. So that is the book of the month for August. Join me in September and I'm going to stop the stream. Thank you for joining very much.